Hey guys, Kid Aikino here. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Uh, the holidays were really busy, and then uh, thanks to various personal plans, the first half or so of January was really busy as well. I probably could have knocked this one out earlier, but I really wanted to get that Mothra vs. Godzilla video out of the way first. Anyway, I'm back in the saddle now, and I'm gonna try to stay there. This episode's got a pretty exciting lineup, with a couple of great Toho films, plus Daie throwing their hat in the ring with three films, including a period piece, so... It's gonna be interesting. First up, we have Frankenstein Conquers the World. There's a lot to talk about with this one. I know I mentioned in my first video essay how it addresses the atomic bombings at the end of World War II more explicitly than pretty much any other kaiju film, certainly any of its time. The opening depicts the bombing of Hiroshima, where the immortal heart of Frankenstein's monster, smuggled from Germany as the Allies approached, is caught in the blast while being examined at an army hospital. The seriousness of the bombing is undercut somewhat by the sci-fi trappings that surround it in the film, but this film's treatment of it, 20 years after the event and 11 years after the original Godzilla, is still noteworthy. The film's examination of the effects of the bombing years later is a bit more nuanced. After the bombing, we flash forward 15 years to find Nick Adams as Dr. James Bowen, researching radiation therapy and examining patients with cancer caused by the bombings. The inclusion of these details is interesting, especially juxtaposed with the creation of a giant Frankenstein monster from radiation. The use of radiation to treat the effects of radiation suggests a commentary on the emergence of constructive uses of nuclear energy. Notably, as Japan rapidly modernized during its recovery from World War II, the year following this film's release would see Japan's first nuclear power plant begin operating. It's made even more interesting by the fact that Bowen is American. I don't know exactly how late in the game Nick Adams was brought on board. I do believe the film was already in development before Saperstein stepped in and said, hey, you know, you could use an American actor in this for overseas uh, marketing purposes. But I'm not sure if uh, the character Adams plays had actually been conceived at that point or intended to be an American? I don't really know. Regardless, the implication that Bowen is in some way helping to repair the damage his own country did to Japan is a classic example of the optimistic treatment of international cooperation and reconciliation in Ishiro Honda's films. Even when juxtaposed against grimmer details like an old man comparing the feral young Frankenstein regrown from the irradiated heart, to the orphaned children who populated Japan's streets shortly after the war. And how's the monster stuff, you ask? It's pretty neat, too. Both Frankenstein and the monster Baragon are smaller than most Toho kaiju, so the miniatures are at a larger scale, lending an interesting look to some of their scenes. It's also a testament to the craftsmanship that goes into those miniatures that Frankenstein being so human, a stuntman in makeup rather than a suit, doesn't completely ruin the illusion of every shot he's in. Next, we come to the first Gamera film, which is interestingly split between the sort of child-friendly capers the sequels would become known for and a more Toho-style straight kaiju spectacle. It incorporates the mythological origin found in the original Godzilla, though it's sort of disjointed. Gamera is said to originate from Atlantis, but why the leads are making contact with an Inuit village to learn about this is unclear. It makes more effective use of a mystery subplot in which Gamera's initial appearance is quickly forgotten by the media in favor of a series of flying saucer sightings. When the military flips Gamera onto its back, the nature of these sightings is revealed as Gamera fires jets of flame from its shell and takes off into the sky. The human plot is a bit scattershot, its biggest weakness being Toshio, the first Kenny in a Japanese kaiju film. The idea of a child character being fascinated with the monsters makes sense. I mean, kids love these movies. But Toshio's obsession with Gamera borders on derangement, honestly. There's also the reporter Aoyagi's weird obsession with Kyoko, who at the end is rather bluntly encouraged to quit her job and settle down with him. It's all very weird. Daie had no experience in the kaiju genre, no dedicated special effects department like Toho's, 
and Gamera's budget was considerably smaller than that of Invasion of Astro Monster, released the same year. But bearing all that in mind, while it certainly is no Invasion of Astro Monster, the result is fairly impressive, and the Plan Z scene, even if the scale involved is ridiculous, shows some imagination. I can see why this one did well enough to merit a sequel. Invasion of Astro Monster is a classic. I believe this is the film where Godzilla spends the least amount of time on screen, but you hardly notice because the rest of the film is just pure entertainment. This one features some of the most ambitious production design of any of Toho's special effects films up to this point. You've got a rocket ship, an alien planet, an underground civilization, a strange race of aliens, flying saucers, and that's all before the monsters even show up. There's also the influence of co-producer Henry Saperstein from UPA, evident in the film jumping straight into the action with the astronauts on the way to Planet X, which was a concession to the short attention span of America's television audiences. There's also the standout performance by Nick Adams, who's really allowed to shine here as a suave American astronaut. He alone makes this film's English dub as essential as the original soundtrack, but even dubbed into Japanese, he still makes an impression alongside Akira Takarada as a fellow astronaut, Akira Kubo as a boyish, determined inventor, and Kumi Mizuno as the alien femme fatale. And there's even some pretty good monster fighting in this show, too. Next up, there's Gamera vs. Barogon. It seems like Daiei initially decided to lean into creating a big, splashy Toho-style spectacle for the sequel, with twice the first Gamera's budget. Overall, it's pretty effective. I haven't watched this one as often as films like Gamera vs. Giron or Gamera Super Monster over the years, so I came back to this one for the rewatch with a pretty clean slate, and I have to say I was really impressed. It's built around kind of a crime story. The protagonist participates in an expedition to retrieve a large opal stashed in a cave in New Guinea by his brother during World War II, when he's double-crossed by one of his brother's former comrades and left for dead. After a native girl explains to him that the opal was actually a monster's egg, he returns to Japan to try and stop Barugan once it hatches, with Gamera joining the fight after escaping the rocket that carried him away at the end of the last film. Not only is the human plot interesting, but the miniature effect scenes, while not always terribly fast-paced, are pretty impressive as well. You can see where the extra cash Daiei spent on this film went, some of the sets are clearly quite large. I suppose for a film not explicitly aimed at children, the amount the monsters bleed in this film isn't that shocking, though Toho hadn't really gone there since Godzilla Raids again. What's more surprising is that this element was kept when further Gamera sequels adopted a more overtly child-focused approach. And last for this episode is one I hadn't seen before, Daimajin. This one's a Daiei period drama about the exiled son and daughter of a feudal lord killed in a coup, returning to their old village to overthrow the tyrannical ruler who took their father's place, aided by a gigantic Majin statue that comes to life. The majority of the film is dedicated to the political drama, with the titular statue only really intervening in the last act. It's definitely different from your typical kaiju film, but it's a really solid piece of work. The production value is consistently impressive, with some really interesting design choices, and the special effects are more impressive than either of the Gamera films released up to this point. Hell, the optical effects are better than Toho's were at that time. There's one shot I remember where the giant statue goes to free the protagonist from the cross he's been placed on after being captured, that really shocked me with how convincing it was. It sounds a bit funny, but I actually had to rewind and watch that one again just to figure out what they'd done there. So at the beginning of the shot, we see the cross and the struggling hero in the foreground as the statue approaches. Usually with a shot like this, you'd have the actor on a life-size cross in front of another shot of the actor in the Majin costume approaching, either rear-projected or combined with optical compositing. This is what I figured I was looking at as the statue approached and reached for the cross. Since the Majin and the hero couldn't physically interact, this is where you'd typically then cut to another shot. Instead, we stay on this shot as the statue actually grabs the cross and begins pulling it down. It really defied my expectations in that respect, especially considering what I'd seen of other special effects films of that era. And for a few seconds I really was at a loss to explain the illusion I was looking at, 
and was forced to take the image at face value. Even as I rationally knew it was an illusion, a more instinctive, kind of intuitive part of me was completely fooled for a few seconds. It was only on the second viewing that I realized that the cross was also a miniature, and the hero struggling against his bonds was a surprisingly convincing motorized puppet. I love the effects in other tokusatsu films of this period, but none of them have had quite that effect on me before. And on that note, I'm looking forward to the next episode where I'll look at Daimajin's two sequels, plus War of the Gargantuas, Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, and Gamera vs. Gauss. Thank you very much to my patrons, especially Exploder Button, John Pinier, and Ryan Clark. My Patreon and social media are linked in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.